It's time to relax, grab a drink, pull up a chair by the hearth, and have a seat in the Skald Circle to listen to the tale of The Black Bowl from Japanese folklore. It's told by Casimir. Before we begin our story, we wanted to remind you that we release new tales for free every week. Our shorter tales release on Wednesdays, and our longer chapter stories release on every other Saturday. Find out where you can hear them on our website at thescaldcircle.com. And be certain to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, or whatever your favorite podcast app is. That way, you'll never miss out on one of our enchanting tales from around the world. And this is the tale of the Black Bowl. Long ago, in a part of the country not very remote from Kyoto, the great gay city, there dwelt an honest couple. In a lonely place was their cottage, upon the outskirts of a deep wood of pine trees. Folks had it that the woods were haunted. They said it was full of deceiving foxes. They said that beneath the mossy grounds the elves built their kitchens. They said that long-nosed Tengu had tea parties in the forest thrice a month, and that the fairies' children played at hide-and-seek there every morning before seven. Over and above all this, they didn't mind saying that the honest couple were queer in their ways, that the woman was a wise woman and the man was a warlock, which was as may be. But sure it was that they did no harm to a living soul and that they lived as poor as poor, and that they had one fair daughter. She was as neat and pretty as a princess, and her manners were very fine. But for all that she worked as hard as a boy in the rice field and within doors she was a housewife indeed, for she washed and cooked then drew water. She went barefoot in a grey homespun gown and tied back her hair with a tough wistario tendril. Brown she was and thin, but the sweetest beggar maid that ever made shift with a dry bed of moss and no supper. By and by, the good man, her father, dies, and the wise woman, her mother, sickens within the year, and soon she lies in the corner of the cottage waiting for her end, with the maid near her crying bitter tears. Child, said the mother, do you know you are as pretty as a princess? Am I that, says the maid, and goes on with her crying. Do you know that your manners are fire, says the mother. Are, are they then, said the maid, and goes on with her crying. My own baby, said the mother. Could you stop your crying a minute and listen to me? So the maid stopped crying and put her head close by her mother's on the poor pillow. Now listen, said the mother. And afterwards remember, it is a bad thing for a poor girl to be pretty. If she is pretty and lonely and innocent, none but the gods will help her. They will help you, my child, and I have thought of a way besides. Fetch me the great black rice bowl from the shelf. The girl fetched it. See now, I put it on your head and all your beauty is hidden away. Alas, mother, said the poor child, it is heavy. It will save you from what is heavier to bear, said the mother. If you love me. Promise me that you will not move it till the time comes. I promise, I promise, but how shall I know when the time comes? That you shall know. And now help me outside for the sweet morning dawns. And I fancy to see the fairy's children once again as they run in the forest. So the child, having the black ball upon her head, held her mother in her arms in a grassy place near the great trees. And presently they saw the fairies' children threading their way between the dark trunks as they played at hide and seek. The bright garments fluttered and they laughed lightly as they went. The mother smiled to see them. Before seven she died very sweetly as she smiled. When her little store of rice was done, the maid with the wooden bowl knew well enough she must starve or go and find more. So first she tended her father's and mother's graves and poured water for the dead as is meat and recited many a holy text. Then she bound on her sandals, kilted her gray skirts to show her scarlet petticoat, tied her household goods in blue-printed handkerchief, and sent out all alone to seek her fortunes, the brave girl. For all her slenderness and pretty feet, she was a rarely odd sight, and soon she was to know it. The great black bowl covered her head and shadowed her face, and as she went through a village, two women looked up from washing in the stream, stared, and laughed. It's a bogger to come alive, says one. Out upon her, cried the others, for a shameless wench. Out upon her false modesty to roam the country thus with her head in a black bowl, as who should cry aloud to every passing man, Come and see what is hidden. 
It is enough to make a wholesome body sick. On went the poor maid, and sometimes the children pelted her with mud and pebbles for sport. Sometimes she was handled roughly by village louts who scoffed and coughed at her dress as she went. They even laid hands upon the bowl itself and sought to drag it from her head by force. But they only played at that game once, for the bowl stung them as fiercely as if it had been made of nettle, and the bullies ran away howling. The beggar maiden might seek her fortune, but it was very hard to find. And she might ask for work, but see, would she get it? None were wishful to employ a girl with a black bowl on her head. At last, on a fine day, when she was tired out, she sat upon a stone and began to cry as if her heart would break. Down rolled her tears from under the black bowl. They rolled down her cheeks and reached her white chin. A wandering ballad singer passed that way and with his biwa slung across his back. He had a sharp eye and marked the tears upon the maid's white chin. It was all he could see of her face, and, O oh, girl with the black ball on your head, quoth he, why do you sit weeping by the roadside? I weep, she answered, because the world is hard. I am hungry and tired, and no one will give me work or pay me money. Now that's unfortunate, said the ballad singer, for he had a kind heart. But I haven't a rin of my own, or it would be yours. Indeed, I am sorry for you. It is the circumstances the best I can do for you is to make you a little song. With that, he whips his biwa around and thrums on it with his fingers, and starts as easy as you may please. To the tears on your white chin, he says, and sings. The wild chariot droops by the roadside. Beware of the black canopy of cloud. Hark, hear the rain. Hear the rainfall from the black canopy of cloud. Alas, the wild cherry, its sweet flowers are marred, marred are the sweet flowers, forlorn on the spray. Sir, I do not understand your song, said the girl, with the bowl on her head. Yet it is plain enough, said the ballad singer, and went his way. He went to the house of a passing rich farmer. In he went, and they asked him to sing before the master of the house. With all the will in the world, says the ballad singer, I will sing him a new song that I have just made. So he sang of the wild cherry and the great black cloud. When he made an end, Tell us the interpretation of your song, says the master of the house. With all the will in the world, quoth the ballad singer, the wild cherry is the face of a maiden whom I saw sitting by your way gate. She wore a great black wooden bowl upon her head, which is the great black cloud in my song, and from under it her tears flowed like rain for I saw the drops upon her white chin. And she said that she wept for hunger because no one would give her work nor pay her money. Now I would might help this poor girl with the ball on her head, said the master of the house. That you may if you wish, quoth the ballad singer. She sits but a stone's throw from your gate. The long and short of it is that the maid was put to labor in the rich man's harvest field. All day long she worked in the waving rice, and with her gray skirts kilted and her sleeves bound back with cords. All day long she plied the sickle, and the sun shone upon the black bowl. But she had food to eat and good rest at night, and was well content. She found favor in her master's eyes, and he kept her in the field till all the harvest was gathered in. Then he took her into his house, where there was plenty for her to do, for his wife was but sickly. Now the maiden lived well and happily as a bird, and went singing about her labors. And every night she thanked the august gods for her good fortune. Still she wore the black bowl upon her head. At the New Year's time, bustle, bustle, says the farmer's wife. Scrub and cook and sew, put your best foot foremost, my dear, for we must have the house look at its neatest. To be sure and with all my heart, says the girl, and she put her back into the work. But mistress, says she, if I may be so bold as to ask, are we having a party or what? Indeed we are, and many of them, says the farmer's wife. My son, that is in Kyoto, the great and gay, is coming home for a visit. Presently home he comes, the handsome young man. Then the neighbors were called in, and great was the merrymaking. They feasted and they danced, they jested and they sang. Many a bowl of good red rice they ate, and many a cup of good sake they drank. All this time the girl with the bowl in her head plied her work modestly in the kitchen, and well out of the way she was. The farmer's wife saw to that, good soul. All the same, one fine day, the company called for more wine, and the wine was done so that the son of the house takes up the sake bottle, 
and goes with it himself. What should he see there but the maiden sitting on a pile of branches and fanning the kitchen fire with a split bamboo fan? My life, I must see what is under that black bowl, says the handsome young man to himself. And sure enough, he made it his daily care, and peeped as much as he could, which was not very much. But seemingly it was enough for him, for he thought no more of Kyoto, the great and gay, but stayed at home to do his courting. His father laughed and his mother fretted. The neighbors held up their hands all to no purpose. Oh, dear, dear maiden with the wooden bowl, she shall be my bride and no other. I must and will have her, cried the impetuous young man, and very soon he fixed the wedding day himself. When the time came, the young maidens of the village went to array the bride. They dressed her in a fair and costly robe of white brocade, and in a trailing hakama of scarlet silk, and on her shoulders they hung a cloak of blue and purple and gold. They chattered, but as for the bride, she never said a word. She was sad because she brought her bridegroom nothing and because his parents were sore at his choice of a beggar maid. She said nothing, but the tears glistened on her white chin. Now off with the ugly old bull, cried the maidens. It's time to dress the bride's hair and to do it with golden combs. So they laid hands to the bowls and would have lifted away, but they could not move it. Try again, they said, and tugged at it with all their might, but it would not stir. There's witchcraft in it, they said. Try a third time. They tried a third time, and still the bowl stuck fast but it gave out fearsome moans and cries. Ah, let be, let be for pity's sake, said the poor bride, for you make my head ache. They were forced to lead her as she was to the bridegroom's presence. My dear, I am not afraid of the wooden bowl, said the young man. So they poured the sake from the silver flagon, and from the silver cup the two of them drank the mystic, three times three, that made them man and wife. Then the black bowl burst asunder with a loud noise and fell to the ground in a thousand pieces. With it fell a shower of silver and gold and pearls and rubies and emeralds and every jewel of price. Great was the astonishment of the company, as they gazed upon a dowry that for a princess would have been rich and rare. But the bridegroom looked upon the bride's face. My dear, he said, there are no jewels that shine like your eyes. And that is the tale of the Black Bowl from Japanese folklore. Thank you for listening to our story. If you enjoyed it, we recommend taking a look at our Patreon page, as noted in the description below. You can earn great rewards while also supporting us, to keep these stories alive for generations to come. Also, remember to subscribe to us on your podcast app, and leave us a five-star rating if you enjoyed this story. A special thank you to Cat for their support this month. Without your contribution, we wouldn't be able to continue these stories, and we truly appreciate it. Visit thescaldcircle.com to stay up to date with all of our current events, news, and much more. Not only that, but you can also visit our story archive of every tale we have ever told. It's sorted by origin and region for the convenience of your listening pleasure. Thank you for listening to our story. <laughs>